Imagine your hair falling out for no clear reason, and not just the hair on your head, but all over your body. Alopecia areata. It's an autoimmune disease that affects 6.8 million Americans. Joining us today on Second Opinion, primary care physician, Dr. Lou Papa, from the University of Rochester Medical Center. Hair loss, alopecia, which is the medical term for hair loss, um, can be the sign of other things and not just something on your scalp. Dermatologist, Dr. Brett King from Yale School of Medicine. We're able to take people who have no hair at all and give it all back. And founder of Bald Girls Do Lunch, Thea Chasson. We do want people to have accurate information and not go to Dr. Google. And Sherry Schaefer, who is here to share her personal story. Not only was my hairline creeping up in the back, I had some bald spots. I'm Joan London, and it's all coming up on Second Opinion. Thank you all for being here today. I want to start with Sherry. You've been a hairstylist for years, so you know how hair can kind of, almost kind of define a person. Uh, as I understand it, you were 39, and I think a hairstylist there in the salon said to you that you were starting to lose some hair in the back. What was happening? Yes, it, I was wearing my hair up that day, and she noticed that the nape of my neck had a big bald area and um, pointed it out. And that night I went home and really checked it out and realized that not only was my hairline creeping up in the back, I had some bald spots in the back as well, further up the head. So did you go right to the doctor? Yes, I went to my internist who I had a regular relationship with and I had just colored my hair two or three weeks prior to noticing the hair loss with some new henna that the salon had gotten in and he was pretty certain it was the henna. That it somehow like burned the scalp or something? Even though I had no signs of burning or inflammation, he, yes, he, he thought that's what it was. But he said to be sure I should go to a dermatologist and get an official diagnosis. He, he, I think he knew he was a little bit out of his specialty with this. Okay, but I want to come to you, Lou, because you're a primary care physician. Right. And, you know, most of us, when anything goes wrong, we come to you first. <laughs> so uh, how, how do you... When you see something like this, are there tests you can run? Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's very interesting, Sherry, how often people are sent to me by their barber or their stylist because oh, they yeah. notice hair loss. Um, and it comes up a lot, it's a very common thing, but it's really important that, you know, hair loss, alopecia, which is the medical term for hair loss, um, can be the sign of other things and not just something on your scalp. So usually it requires a careful examination of the scalp. Is there other lesions on the scalp where the hair loss is? Does the scalp look healthy? Does it look scarred? We have to review medications because there's some very common medications that can cause hair loss. Other really? than just chemotherapy, yeah. It's rare, but you need to review that, especially if you recently started a medication. Um, and then once you do that, there are some conditions that are associated with hair loss. There's, there's forms of lupus that can cause hair loss. Um, thyroid issues and hormonal issues can cause hair loss, and iron deficiency can cause hair loss. So very often, that's the beginning of it, but very often it's not unusual to refer to a dermatologist because there are some more serious forms of hair loss that you really want to address quickly, and you can kind of get the ball rolling um, before you send them to the dermatologist. So did you go off to the dermatologist, Sherry? I did, okay. and we talked about doing a biopsy, but he decided because I was presenting so classically with my alopecia areata that a biopsy wasn't necessary. So, But by the, time, say, by, by the time you went to the dermatologist, had you lost more hair? Unfortunately, it can take a few weeks to get in to see a specialist. And by the time I got to him, I had lost probably about 30, 35% or so of my hair. And that's another reason why for the primary care doctor to begin that process because sometimes access can be an issue and that information can be available to the dermatologist so the workup can go a little bit more. And especially with that class and classic pattern of alopecia areata that she's talking about, you can actually examine the scalp and the hair can look a specific way that an internist or a primary care doctor can pick up on. So you're saying, Sherry, the dermatologist immediately said, we've got to treat this. What did they do? He gave me a prescription designed to reduce the inflammation in the areas of loss and told me to rub it in twice a day. And the rest of my hair that hadn't come out yet was really, really thick. 
So it, it was hard to get in there, um, but I did. But after about three or four weeks of doing that and, and not seeing any progress, I became disheartened and decided to just let it do what it was going to do. Did it eventually grow back? It did. It, he, the dermatologist did say it would very likely get worse before it got better. And it, it did all fall out along with my eyebrows, my eyelashes, and most of my body hair. Wow. And in about a year and a half, uh, it did fully come back though. And then it went again several more times. This summer, I lost it for the fourth time. Wow. All right. So I want a basic question because I've heard of alopecia, right. hair loss, but this was alopecia areata. areata. What's the difference? So alopecia is like saying fever. It's really just defining. Alopecia means hair loss. Okay. And then you have to characterize that further on. And alopecia areata is a focal. It's really, and I actually actually had this myself, Joan. I actually had uh, alopecia areata this past year in the back of my head. And it's a very well circumscribed. It almost looks like someone cut out a part of your hair very specifically. There's no hair at all. The scalp like still looks healthy. You yeah, like, like they waxed you in a very so specific. No follicles showing. Uh, at all. No follicles, but the scalp looks healthy. It's not scarred. Um, so it's usually to an area. And some people lose it over their entire head, and that's, uh, you know, alopecia totalis. Universalis, it's everywhere. Everywhere on your body you lose hair. Um, so it's, it's alopecia areata, a very small patch. It's very geographic. Totalis or universalis. Um, I want to say something about the, the patterns and how variable they can be from person to person and even within one's own experience because I had a classical patch in the back of my head found by my hairstylist, very common. And then it was 10 years, it was a full decade until I had one other patch. And then it was another decade. And at that time my hair began to just thin out, became very diffuse all over, although I did get the baldness up the back of the head called lophiasis. And at that time, you know, in between, it was kind of hard to make a diagnosis because it, the thinness looked like it could be some other kind of hair loss. So the patterns can be quite different. And I had my eyebrows for quite a long time. And, you know, so in my instance, all my body hair went first. Then my scalp hair started to get kind of you know, thin and not, I had hair, but no hair do. And later on, I lost my eyebrows and now I still have some lashes. So, doctor, I want to come to you. Let, let's start with, uh, can just anybody get this? Who tends to get alopecia? Yeah, so alopecia areata uh, can affect uh, anybody. Uh, we see infants with it, and we see, uh, you know, adults in their 60s or 70s present with it for the first time. Um, I, the majority of people present probably by the age of 40. Uh, but again, it can present in any decade of life for the first time. And it's, it's often a waxing and waning disorder, as, as we've heard. Uh, and it can also be a chronic disorder. When, when, when it is severe and when there's complete loss or severe amounts of scalp hair loss, it's often chronic and people don't experience long periods of regrowth where they enjoy all of their hair for months or years at a time before another episode. And so, so we think of it sort of being in two patterns, mild where patches come and go, and then chronic severe where there's so much hair loss that it would be obvious to others. And, and that pattern tends to be uh, chronic. And is there a genetic component? Yeah, it's a great question. The genetics of alopecia areata are very well described. There are many genes involved, and each gene is a chance of developing the disorder. And so it's kind of like Powerball. It's unlikely that one gene turns on. It's highly unlikely that many genes turn on. And so that's why it can run in families, but only one person or two people get it, and the others don't. Just in the same way, sometimes it can grow back, but it might not grow back, correct? Correct, it, and it's really, it's one of, the, it, it's one of the, the, the parts of this that I think is so menacing and distressing for people who have it 
is that it's highly unpredictable. One of my colleagues uh, likes to say the only thing predictable about alopecia areata is that it's unpredictable. And, and so people do their best to try to control it, you know, environmental factors, diet, uh, exercise, um, you know, these sorts of things, but it's going to do, the biology is going to happen in spite of what we do, unless, unless we turn to medicine. Sherry, you lost it, it came back, you lost it, it came back, and at some point you decided to shave your head, right? Right, it, each time, it, psychologically, it just, it, it gives you some sense of control when you're the one that removes the final strands of hair. And, and I felt a little more empowered. And of course it made it easier to pop wigs on and off without hair. And then and I should point out, uh, as, you, as you guys probably know, I went through chemotherapy for a year for breast cancer and I was bald for a year. And it's a real shocker. You know, but I was advised by someone, another colleague of mine, Robin Roberts, actually. She said, shave it. Don't just let it start coming out on the pillow or as you're serving guest food. Like, just you do it, and then you've taken charge of it. And I have to say, I felt a little like G.I. Joan. You know, when I went in there and got my head shaved in a hair salon, they thought, like, I was, like, wacko. But it, it was... Uh, to me, it was psychologically better to do that. You had teenagers too, and I also had young kids. How did they deal with it? Not very well. They would say things like, mom, my friend so-and-so is coming over later. Can you make sure you've got your wig on? <laughs> and even without the friends, just for them to see me without my hair was hard. So I, I usually made sure that I had a wig on when I was around them, unless it was a really hot day, and I, in which case I would turn to them and say, kids, I'm sorry. Today, it's about me and my comfort. The wig is coming off. And in the salon, since you brought that up, what about other people? Because sometimes there's probably a sense that, is it contagious? Yes. When I first was diagnosed with alopecia areata, I really was reluctant to even tell my clients because I, I knew, of course, it wasn't contagious, but I thought maybe they might be a little concerned that it was. But um, I, I told them anyway because I wanted them to know what was going on with their stylist. And Thea, I want to bring Thea in because I know this is firsthand experience for you. But you did something. You started this group called Bald Girls Do Lunch. I love that. So what are, what, what are you doing? You're connecting people who are dealing with the psychological and emotional effects of, of this. So what is your goal with the group? Well, the goal of the group is really all falls under education. We do want people to have accurate information and not go to Dr. Google. And I would like to just add in that conversation earlier about shaving is that I have met so many women who have shaved their heads. I have met nobody who has said they regretted it, but I have talked to so many women who wish they had done it sooner. So the collective experiences that our organization brings to people through our articles and writing and in-person and you know, phone calls and all the ways that we connect, um, connect with the women and also teen girls with um, alopecia areata helps them because there is this collectivity from, of information from the community that I'm leading. There's a tremendous impact with that kind of support from others, that feeling that you're not just alone. That's right, that's right. The isolation can be huge. And what is true is that the moment that a person who has never met another person with alopecia areata does have the opportunity to meet another person, it's like their shoulders were here, and now they're, and then they're like, even when people come into a lunch when we were meeting in a restaurant, I, you know, there's a certain tension. It's a new situation. Maybe they have not met anybody else and they've never talked about their alopecia areata at all. We, we go into that too, how to talk to people. Um, and then, you know, after just a short while, you know, between appetizer and dessert, <laughs> the shoulders are down, the smiles come out. And of course, it's, it's gratifying um, to see this happen and to see the connections that people make with each other. And I should add, we're talking about bald girls do lunch. 
and obviously, as you've said, this can happen to men too. Yes, yeah. we, and we should just point out it does, and and it, it uh, probably I don't get through a week without somebody coming in and saying, you know, I'm worried I'm losing my hair. It's a really? very common complaint. Really, and is you that said, common? Absolutely, and I think the aspect of you saying it helped it defined your personality. All of us can deal with the slowness of aging, but a sudden change, yes, and something that's so defining yeah. is, is is as life-altering for a man. When a young man comes in and, and says, I think I'm balding like my father, what, what can I do? You know, unfortunately, the vast majority of, of hair loss that I see is usually pattern baldness, either, you know, male or female pattern baldness, which is not a lot that you can do about. But it is important to make sure there are some serious diseases that can be associated with hair loss. Um, but it is as distressing for men as it is for women. Well, I want to talk to Dr. King about a, a new therapy that's really exciting. Uh, for helping the treatment of alopecia areata. Tell us about this new treatment and how it's helping patients. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's really interesting to, to take a walk, a quick walk through the history of this disease, you know, really up until just recently and still I think all too often, uh, this idea that alopecia areata is caused by stress is, is perpetuated and it continues to be perpetuated, but certainly, in the in the you know the 1900s, there you know medical report after medical report, alopecia areata is caused by stress, and then and then and then recently, and it was really with the genetics in 2010, and then in 2014, a seminal discovery of the the underpinnings of the disease, the biological underpinnings of the disease, which elucidated uh, a really important pathway that mediates hair loss in alopecia areata. And, and we are able to, with a, with a relatively new class of medicines called Janus kinase inhibitors or JAK inhibitors, we're able to intervene directly in this pathway and halt and reverse hair loss wow. in patients with alopecia areata. And so we're able to, and this is this is work that uh, I've been doing for the last seven years, and now it's really, it, it it's not yet mainstream, but we're in the middle of now phase three clinical trials of medicines. And so I'm really hoping that in the next year to two years, we're gonna have FDA approved medicines for severe forms of alopecia areata with, with this class of medicines called JAK inhibitors. They're orally administered medicines, and we're able to take people who have no hair at all and give it all back. It's really, it's the results are unbelievable. They're so eye catching. It's just, it's really spectacular. This class of medicines is completely and forever transformed, will transform uh, this disorder. Uh, and so it's just, it's a real, it, it's an amazing story of science and how science can inform medicine. Uh, and and it's just, there's a lot of excitement about it. And I should point out that the, it, what, it's been used in other things. It's been used uh, in RA, in psoriatic arthritis and oncology. It's a drug that has been used in other things, but as happens so often, it was discovered that this could also be used in this area. Totally, yeah, it, you know, it, it should not surprise surprise us that, right, alopecia areata is an autoimmune condition. And so necessarily it shares, right, the pathways, the biological processes that make it happen are shared with other autoimmune and inflammatory disorders, such as the ones you mentioned, psoriasis, uh, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. And so this class of medicines is broadly important uh, in dermatology, but also across all fields or all subspecialties of medicine. So Dr. King, regarding these JAK inhibitors, um, the promise sounds great, but is it something that has to be taken for the rest of their lives? And most importantly, are there any serious side effects that you're seeing with these? Yeah, it's, it's an important question. So bad alopecia areata, severe alopecia areata tends to be chronic. And so we should expect that when a treatment works, one will need to take it chronically in order to maintain hair regrowth. While I say that, I do have a handful of patients out of two or 300 that are undergoing treatment who have taken treatment and 
are now off of it for a period of two or three years and maintaining all of their hair. And so I expect that people will need to take them uh, forever, but there will be some who will not. And and the second part of your question, are there are there side effects or potential side effects of jack inhibitors? For sure, there is so the important thing here is to note that there's what is called a black box warning for cancer and infections and blood clots with this class of medicines. Now, what I think is most important to know about that, there are a lot of medicines with these kinds of risks. In fact, probably the the most successful, in a sense, medicine ever, a medicine called adalimumab, has a black box warning. And so, 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 so we shouldn't we shouldn't think of this as oh no, everybody's going to get sick taking these medicines. These are extremely rare events, but nevertheless, these are discussions that are really important to be had between the physician and the patient. Thea, you really give women that kind of the ammunition to walk through life uh, and be able to really have something ready to say to people who are wondering what's wrong or is it contagious? And all of that just makes you feel stronger, right? Yeah, it totally does. There are four things I think that are the, the challenges that are so common. Firstly, is being mistaken for a cancer patient. So for people with alopecia, areata, it, it's, it's important to know what you're going to say, how you're going to say it, because the person coming up to you has definitely in a different situation or has been through one or they know someone's been through one. I think the second thing that people think about a lot and they feel is a loss of femininity and also the challenge of getting stuck. I am very much um, a proponent of choice and options. Bald is not a goal, but if you're willing to experiment, I like to say you have unlimited do-overs. If you try something one day, Maybe you've always gone to work with a headscarf or something, and then you decide, well, I think I want to get a wig, or I think I'm going to shave my head and go bald. If you don't like it, you have unlimited do-overs. You can try it again another way. And this is the kind of positive proaction that Bald Girls Do Lunch um, is about. And it's I, a nice, I, I think it's kind it's of a nice way to think of life, too, Thea, is that you got do-overs, you got right, do-overs exactly. and all kinds of things. I see the whole time you've been talking, Sherry's been shaking her head. Yes, yes, yes. Final thoughts, Sherry? Oh, I love what Thea said. Um, it, and so much of it is based on your personality. And it, it's helpful to remember that with hair loss, it's a process. It, you might have been diagnosed with alopecia areata two weeks ago and just cannot imagine wearing a different wig every day if you want to, but that's that's one of the gifts of it if you choose to go in that direction. Um, alopecia can take your hair, and I'm going to take my wig off and show you what mine looks like at the moment, but don't let it take your joy in life. It, it, you have that control, just like we were talking about earlier with shaving your head. As the hair loss ramps up, um, you, you get a sense of control. Well, you get to decide where to go from that point on. So this is mine now. See, this I think you look great that way too. Look at that. <laughs> and again, you get to have whatever you want, whatever look you want that day. Yes. You guys, I love, love, love your attitude. Um, and I really appreciate you sharing your stories, especially considering the, the numbers, the statistics right. of how many people deal with this everywhere. And needless to say, Dr. King, we thank you for the great work that you're doing in this field and the hope that it's going to give so many people. Thank you all, and Lou, thank you as always. And I also want to thank all the medical advisors who are with us every step of the way to ensure that we bring you evidence-based, accurate medical information. And of course, to all of you at home, thank you for watching. From all of us here at Second Opinion, we encourage you to take charge of your health care. I'm Joan London. Be well.
Find more information about this series at secondopinion-tv.org. You can also follow us on Facebook and YouTube.